So now we turn our attention to what would be called the post calibration tasks. These are the things listed here that are all configured over basically in the lights panel. We have subframe weighting, image registration, local normalization, and image integration. Now these things are all turned on by default. So WBPP is now configured to do everything for you when you run the script. As I described previously, I do think that it's instructional to do just a calibrate only and then learn each of these processes before utilizing it in, you know, fully in WBPP. There's always been an argument. People have argued that you need to learn how to do things manually. Uh, not necessarily. I think WBPP actually gives you, from an instructional point of view, a lot of that information. Um, and even in a better way, you can see the relationship between the data, how things are matching, all kinds of uh, very interesting things. So I think today the better way of saying it is that uh, WBPP can be used to do the calibration of data, but the post-calibration, a lot of these processes, they do have some intricacies that you'll want to see um, as a standalone process on your own before you ultimately put them to their their powers here in this automatic sense of a, of a pipeline in WBPP. Okay, the thing that I want to mention here is that uh, there is the, the first one on the list is really, it is a uh, post-processing consideration, but it's a special one. And I have a video at Adam Block Studios that covers this. It is a cosmetic type correction that will get rid of uh, column, I wouldn't call them defects, but column artifacts that are in certain types of sensors, especially, by the way, CCD type sensors, less common, um, at least it's been my experience, to find this particular kind of artifact in CMOS sensors today. So I'm going to just skip that one for now and concentrate on the others. The, and I'll go right down the list. The first one on the list deals with subframe weighting, and you'll notice there are a number of things to choose from. The idea here is that we are going to give weight to images after, after they've been calibrated um, that will be used in subsequent processing. In fact, these other things uh, that happen in the future, especially local normalization and image integration, take advantage of the calculations and the measurements that, that occur here with subframe weighting. So I have an entire series both on my um, Atom Block Studio site as well as a more summary version of it um, about weighting and normalization, especially the weighting, um, on my YouTube channel. So I would encourage you to visit those. I will try to put links to these things um, on the page that you're watching this from. Uh, that being said, let me just show you a chart so that uh, this will kind of, uh, you'll have a visualization of how to think about where this happens and why it's important. So this chart, I think, illustrates what would be the processing flow that we typically take uh, initially for our images. And this applies whether you're doing it manually or whether, whether you're using a pipeline like uh, WBPP. So you do image calibration. If you have colored uh, a sensor uh, with you know the CFA a color filter array on it, then you have to do the cosmetic correction and followed by the debayering. If you just have the monochrome data after image calibration, then you get to do this thing, and this is what I want to explain, is that after debayering, or right after image calibration of grayscale data, you're going to measure the images in order to assign weights to them. So there are many, many measurements that are independent of the weight. You need to measure the noise, you measure the amount of signal that the, the image has based on photometry, based on the stars in the image, and based on other metrics. So those metrics are recorded. This is actually... Uh, taken from a FITS header, these numbers that you see here. So they're recorded in the FITS header and from which you divine, you determine a weight based on these different methods or schemes of weighting images. And then afterwards, of course, if you have the monochrome data, you can continue to do the cosmetic correction and all of the other post-processing steps of registration, normalization, and image integration. There's an additional complexity if you're doing the drizzle data, which has a slightly different path, but it, you all have to, it all has to go through image integration ultimately. And then finally, if you're doing drizzle, uh, drizzle integration. This is the flow. And all of this entire flow is explained 
um, in my videos at uh, Adam Block Studios. Um, but it is this step here that's actually a new thing as of this year that I'm making this recording in 2022, middle, the middle of 2022. Um, these measurements are now uh, fully integrated into all of the processing that takes place within PixInsight. And to keep things simple, I'm just going to make a, a comment. My comment is, if you had to choose between two, please watch my waiting videos on this, but if you had to choose between two, there's really two major choices here. There's the PSF signal weight, and then there's PSF scale SNR. The PSF scale SNR is the one that is a strictly a signal to noise measure. This uses local normalization in part to calculate uh, a scaling factor, and that is used um, to determine the weights uh, of images that images get based on the signal. The PSF signal weight one, this is the default in PixInsight, and it takes into account not only the signal strength, but also other factors which include the brightness of the background and the quality of the stars. It is something akin to a subframe selector-like weighting scheme, which can be good to capture certain qualities of the image, um, but it also may give not necessarily results that are um, easy to understand. So you have to learn more about how this works in order to appreciate the weights that result from it. So that can be found out in my, in my videos. Uh, so there you go, there's the recommendation. You, I, I'm just gonna simplify it here for the two major choices, PSF signal weight and PSF scale SNR. Then, uh, once you've made that determination, um, image registration is pretty straightforward here as a uh, post calibration thing. Uh, there are a couple of things to be concerned about. But one thing is to generate the drizzle data. Uh, the developers feel that the generation of these extra files really has very little overhead, so they leave it checked. But if you really do not intend to drizzle, um, integrate your images, and this would be appropriate only for images that are undersampled and you have a lot of them, and it makes a difference in the image quality, you do this, but if you don't meet all of those little check boxes, if you can't check off all that stuff, there isn't really a reason to do it. And it just adds to extra files and potentially confusion to people um, on the disk. So I uncheck it in my particular case because I'm not doing so. And then as far as the registration parameters, when you click on the, uh, the box there, you bring up the parameters and then you hit the X here to come back to this screen. So for the registration parameters, uh, very typically, the automatic parameters are going to work just well here, are going to be perfectly good. In fact, for me, they work about 99% of the time when the data is properly, uh, is properly calibrated. There is an issue, uh, a weakness, if you will, of image registration through star alignment, the star alignment process, where if you have a lot of hot pixels in your data, this automatic methodology can fail if you don't take care of the hot pixels. If you do not remove them with cosmetic correction, which I mentioned earlier, I would recommend you do all the time. There are people that do not, and then they run into a problem because the star detection routine, um, especially with undersampled data, may detect hot pixels as stars, and that makes things rather confusing. Then you end up having to worry about the detection of stars and uh, hot pixel removal here, and you try to manipulate these parameters to get it to see the data as it should be seen in order to complete the registration process. The automatic method works 99% of the time when data is clean and calibrated well. So there's my uh, recommendation there. One of the things though about image registration is that it requires a reference frame. You need to align your images with respect to some other frame, some other light frame within the data. And you can align to a single frame, which is typical if you had, let's say, red, green, and blue data. You might align all of the data to one frame, perhaps one of the red frames. That's easy enough to do. What happens is if you leave the mode over here, of the registration reference image. So this, although it's always there, this is referring, this little area right here is basically referring to this 
process. So the image registration reference, if you leave it on auto, it's going to look at all of your light frames and it'll pick from it based on some analysis. Some of that comes from, by the way, the scheme here, um, but it'll pick the best frame that it feels it qualifies as a good frame to use as a reference. And then, of course, you'll see that in the log. You'll see which one it picked. And then it'll use that to align all other frames, too. However, there may be times where you do not want to align certain groups of images with one another. An example, it is actually this example that I've loaded, although I haven't gotten there yet. If you had a mosaic, if you literally had two different sets of data, you might want, and you can do this, this is what's so remarkable about WBPP, you would only want to align images within one of the frames of this mosaic, and then if you had another frame, you would want to align all of those to within that particular frame. But you couldn't do it across both frames, obviously. So there are other choices here as far as alignment. You can pick a method, uh, you can rather pick a reference yourself. It doesn't choose automatically. You can always just choose a particular file. Or, as you'll see a little later, we can actually have it choose um, automatically from within different groups an automatic choice of reference frames. So you can have multiple reference frames and it's based on, I'm just going to say it now, it's based on grouping keywords. That's where that, come, that power comes to be from. You'll see there's an extra option that becomes available when you have keywords in play. So that's in the future, not right now. All right, so image registration is tied to a reference image, which can be assigned in a couple of different ways, either automatically, which it just finds one. And by the way, the automatic method is just fine if you don't... Uh, if you don't mind the overhead of it having to figure out, looking at all your frames, you know, which one is the best one. Um, one thing that I would say uh, as a matter of experience is that the registration of images, assuming that there aren't these big shifts in images and things like that, uh, an average frame is just fine. You don't need the best frame to be a reference for registration. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that the calculation of the centroid of stars, that is the position of stars, doesn't change, it's relatively robust with changes of, uh, say, the seeing, or e even tracking errors at some level, uh, but especially the seeing, even if you have kind of larger stars compared to smaller tight stars, the calculation of the centroid, uh, that is the center of that distribution of light, is still going to be pretty good. So as long as you weren't picking the absolute worst image, you know, you just pick an average image, uh, then registration will proceed normally and you'll have fine results. Local normalization is a new uh, post-calibration process that's really available now. It has become more of the mainstream of the workflow within PixInsight in general. And what it does is it is part of the preparation, if you will, for doing image integration. One of the jobs of image integration, let me just show this to you, is to reject values, especially outlying values. These would be spurious values due to satellite trails, cosmic rays, uh, guiding artifacts, you know, any a number of told things uh, that are not consistent from one frame to the next. You can statistically identify and then only average those values that are not the outlying ones and that produces very clean looking integrated results. In order to do that though, you need the frames to statistically match one another. And what I mean by that is that their backgrounds, their gradients, the other you know, elements of the, the image need to exactly match one another so you can make this comparison of values in order to reject them. Uh, and so that's what the normalization does in general Normalization in the past in PixInsight has been a global measure. You just measure the whole image and you come up with some matching you know, term, whether it's uh, adding or subtracting a value for an offset and multiplying all the values by something, and then that's as good as you can match things. Local normalization is a local measure. It is actually measuring all of this stuff, what it has to do from one frame to the next to match them uh, by looking at, you know, measuring the stars and looking at the backgrounds of the, of the image, the sky of the image, and making 
everything match one another um, at very small scales in the image. So you'll actually find here that there is mention of a normalization scale, and this is really specifying the spatial scale that you're looking at within an image to make these measurements and then fit it across the whole image for matching purposes. So you can see here that there are a number of uh, you know things you're going to choose in evaluation criteria. Of course, my uh, particular choice would be the um, you know in this case for evaluation purposes, PSF signal weight is fine, but for a reference frame, you can either choose a single best frame, the integration of many frames, or there's even now another choice, which I'll show you later, or I'll demonstrate later, which allows you to have an interactive, you get to choose which frames you would like. And that choice means that you're going to actually be stopping, here that would be pressing this button here to do the interactive mode, you'll actually stop the pipeline when it gets to the point of doing the normalization, and then it'll ask you to choose the files at that point. It can't know in advance uh, this information until it gets to that point because it will, won't, will not have made the measurements necessary until it gets to that point in the, in the queue and the processing. So all of this parameter, all these parameters I explain in other videos and other places, but this is what is necessary to do when matching images. And so it is the best way to do it. You don't have to do it though. If you have very clean data, doesn't have any gradients, you can actually just use the standard global, you know, you don't look at this local measure of uh, matching the image in that kind of spatial sense. Um, the global ones work okay. Uh, and the nice thing about the global measures is they're much faster, they're much easier to do. When you include the local normalization, you are um, going to be increasing the overhead of making these calculations. Of course, it potentially getting a much better result, but it does take longer to get it. So you will note that today, WBPP takes longer, um, and that's just because it's a sheer fact of the, it's just doing more calculations. Should it, Literally, more measurements are being made of the data uh, because of these new routines that have been employed here. So it's not that your computer's getting any slower, although a faster computer, you know, sometimes the software leaps ahead and then you gotta get a machine that can take uh, what it, the demands of what the software needs to do with all the data that we're giving it. And then finally, uh, image integration. And I think that most people are familiar with many of these kinds of settings here. You've already seen them with the bias and darks and flats and so on. It, it is really the same stuff now, but because we've done uh, some of these other things with regards to the weighting and the normalization, image integration for light frames takes on a, a slightly more um, nuanced result because now we're going to have uh, weights involved, we have the rejection revolved, involved, and you know we can choose a rejection method, or as I said, the automatic choice is usually pretty good. What happens is if you have a lot of frames, the choice in general that it's going to come up with is this one, the generalized extreme studentized deviate. Man, imagine saying that a couple of times in a row. One of the cool things that I do is that although I don't say it that many times in a row, I do explain it. Um, and so in my videos, I do explain at Adam Block Studios what each of these methods, how they work. So they're not mysteries. So they're not a coin flip for you to choose. Now, it's going to choose this when you have a lot of frames. It'll choose this one when you have kind of a medium number of frames. And then it'll choose this one when you have a small number of frames. That is basically the, uh, the algorithm that takes place. And it's fine. It is fine. Um, it'll do a fine job. I will argue, however, that uh, in particular, some of the algorithms like the Windsor Eye Sigma clipping, in particular, the control of these thresholds is somewhat important to get it to do the right amount of rejection and things like that. Uh, ESD with a large number of frames, um, even these initial values here do relatively well. But understand that this is available here to you. It's with the presumption that you know Although you're going to get a result, it may not be the optimal result because there is some flexibility in being able to manipulate these parameters. Uh, but for most people, for most people, just as this is a starting point, is going to get you about the right spot. 
I know I ran through these items relatively quickly. I just want to assure you that I will be covering them in some detail in other videos in this series. You'll get to see them somewhat in action, uh, but the overview that I've given should be uh, good enough to give you a sense of the how things are kind of interplaying with uh, playing with one another, how they're connected, their relationships to one another. Assuming that we do have everything set up in terms of our post calibration light frame stuff, then finally what you can do is come to the post calibration tab and then make the final decisions about, well, making sure that everything is um, checked that you want to have happen. You'll notice that there's nothing to click here. This is for inf inf information purposes. It's just telling you what is going on in the other tab. Uh, so the only controls that we have here are these two uh, controls for post calibration. The one I want to talk about here first, this is the one that, as I showed earlier, will allow you to choose in this final step how you want to combine the um, any of the frames that might have different exposure times. So if you wanted uh, WBPP to integrate as a group different exposure times, then you will get, uh, you know, I w in this case, I would get three different 10 minute exposures, one in red, green, and blue, and then another set of red, green, and blue in the eight minute exposures. So if I wanted only to get a single red, a single green, and a single blue in this particular case, where I would be combining all of the exposure times in a filter, then I just raise my exposure tolerance to some value that is greater than the difference between the exposure times, and that is going to group everything together. So that's where this exists. Sometimes people don't know where that functionality is. It is right here. It doesn't seem to stand out very much, but it's a very powerful uh, little box there to use. The other powerful box, and I will have a section on this as part of the series of WBPP, this really applies to people who are using the uh, one-shot color camera data that have the color filter array. You can choose whether you want to, when you, um, when you debayer the image, you can debayer it and then produce a single color image. That would be the combined RGB. You can debayer the image and leave them as separate monochrome, red, green, and blue image, images that would be worked on in precisely the same way that I'm showing here, just as a straight monochrome channel. And then you can do both. You can actually output both uh, results from the combined RGB and separate RGBs, and you can see, if, I guess, if there's a difference. So the nice thing about having a one-shot color camera and separating the RGBs into grayscale red, green, and blue images is because, if you recall before, I said that you can register across different colors. You see, if you left it all together as a combined RGB, if there's any um, shift in the colors, that's in the color image originally due to, say, aberration of light, maybe due to the atmosphere, it could be due to optics, it could be due to a, a number of different things, then there is no way to um, align the images on a per color channel to minimize that. But when you separate them into their individual grayscale images as RGB images, and then align them in that way, you can minimize any aberrations, or not any, but you can memorize aberrations that might have, you know, stars might be have a fringe of red on one side and blue on the other. So I'll be demonstrating how this is a very powerful new feature of uh, WBPP to be able to process the data, color data, uh, that is one shot color camera data, a as separate RGB channels, and then combine them to get back, you know, a final um, image. Now you would do that though after WBPP is going to output a final integrated uh, red, green, and blue image. Then of course outside of WBPP you go to color uh, channel combination where then you just make the RGB and it'll have a different answer than whether uh, than compared to whether you had done this which is just the combined RGB. So very powerful stuff there and I'll be demonstrating that uh, for you. Yeah, I should mention if you do the, I had forgotten about this. I think this was added. If you do the separate RGB, you can get it. You don't need to do it outside of WBPP. You can get it to uh, give you the final 
um, RGB for you. It gives you that, does the extra step for you of putting it into the channel combination process.